Hello, everybody. Welcome to All Villa No Filler. Please like and subscribe. Look, I was just sat around. Work had finished. I'd spent the entire day just reliving in my head what Aston Villa did at Burnley, giving praise to our Lord, Professor Unai Emery, plotting where I'm going to put his face tattooed onto my own face. Um, but uh, so work has ended and I thought, hey, what, what shall I do? What shall I do? Shall I actually do something productive with my life? I thought, no, I will not. Instead, I will just go and talk about mighty Aston Villa on the podcast. So, hey, we're in the final week of the transfer window. I want to know what you think we need. What do Aston Villa need in the transfer window as the hours and minutes tick on by and Monchi gets on that phone, gets on the old blur, he's talking to people all over the world, seems to fancy joining the Aston Villa revolution. What do you think is going to happen? This is my own theory, uh, which uh, could be a million miles wrong. So, uh, yeah, uh, just pretend you never heard this if I'm really wrong. And if you did, if I'm right, then, uh, you know, uh, yeah, just just uh, praise me. I don't know. Uh, but look, basically, I think... There could be a big outgoing, right? And I think if I was to think who it might be, I would go with Coutinho. And the reason I'd go Coutinho is because he earns a lot of money, big amount of money, bought him for a lot of money. And if there is a club out there willing to take those wages off uh, the, um, you know, overall wage bill at Villa, free up money to do other things with players who might be around a bit longer, who might be able to be there for, you know, 10 years instead of who knows, uh, I think Coutinho might be one who goes. Uh, there are obviously those links to Qatar. Uh, if they're willing to pay a fee for him, then great. I, To be honest, I'm with it. I'm for it. Uh, and the reason I am, I went to the Villa uh, Everton game and uh, Coutinho came on and you saw his skill, you saw his ability, but you also saw that every time he got the ball, Everton kicked him all over the place. Now, the same happened to Moussa Diaby, but he was able to cope with it, though that does concern me somewhat about potential injuries Moussa Diaby might pick up this season, just knowing the treatment he's going to get. But um, Coutinho, every single time he got the ball, kicked everywhere, you know, um, which is unfair. But, you know, the Premier League, it is just a pretty physical, quite mean league, really, isn't it? And... Uh, Lo and behold, he also got an injury which rules him out for, you know, who knows how long. And this has been a consistent pattern with Coutinho. Uh, you know, now he's late 20s. Uh, I'm not sure if he's turned 30 yet, but I know he's late 20s at least. And um, uh, it, to me, I just think that for his own career, this is just me speaking. I'm not speaking on behalf of all Villa fans. And I would love to be proven wrong if he stays and that he actually goes on and has a great season with Unai Emery and does really well in Europe, particularly for Villa, because I think he can offer something in Europe in particular. Um, but I just think that logically with the uh, injuries that he has he sustains in the Premier League now on quite a regular basis, that perhaps a less physical league might be good for the longevity of his career. That's the way I'd put it. And if it means freeing up a lot of money with wages and potentially getting a transfer fee in, I don't think that's the worst deal ever. But does it leave Villa light? Yes, particularly now that we've lost Buendia. Um, there's a few areas where Villa look a bit light. I would say right back is one that I'm seeing a lot of people mentioning. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Konsa uh, and Matty Cash can play there, of course. But uh, yeah, any more injuries there? Uh, yeah, I can see that we could, I mean, basically, we could do with more depth there, couldn't we? But also, the thing that I did wonder about, you know, the last couple of weeks looking at it, you know, you had concert right back, Diego Carlos, the centre back, and left centre back was uh, Pau Torres. And I did wonder, you know, uh, following the Mings injury, do Villa suddenly look a bit light there as well? You know, if there's a if there's a long term injury to say, I don't know, uh, Pau Torres. Um, or or Diego Carlos, and you're moving concert back across. You know, you're asking a lot of those two play. You're asking a lot of two centre backs then to play a lot of games in Europe and the Premier League without much of a let up. So Villa today have been linked with Clement Longley, obviously uh, a Barcelona player, former Sevilla. He was there when Monchi was there. 
uh, a French international, though he's not played for France for a bit for a while now, and uh, also uh, was on loan at Tottenham. Um, look, he's played at a very high level, isn't he? He's played at the highest level, really. Champions League experience. Um, I'd like to know what the fee potentially would be if we buy him. I would imagine it would potentially be a loan. Uh, I think a loan might be preferable at this stage, uh, perhaps not taking on all of his wages. Uh, and if there is a loan fee, it wouldn't be, you know, stratospheric. Um, but I think he's, you know, I think I've seen mixed reactions to it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm basically am willing to back Emery and Monchi kind of on whatever at the moment. I think they've probably, well, Emery in particular has earned that benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying they're going to get stuff right 100% of the time because they won't. That's, that's impossible. Um, and there's going to be some decisions that we might look back on and go, oh, big regrets. Huge, as she, as Julia Roberts says in uh, uh, Pretty Woman. Big mistake, huge. Um, I had to get that one right. Um, but look, it would be it would be added depth, wouldn't it? And it would mean that Pau Torres wouldn't have to play every single week a left centre-back and you would have somebody who could come in and is, and is just good on the ball as well. That said, Daniel Pritchard made a very good point. Daniel Pritchard, um, you know, AVFC or 1874 Pritch on Twitter. Uh, stats expert's been on this on uh, Orville a few times before. Uh, super guy, really worth following. Check out his Substack. He also made the point that Longley is not really a player who comes in to replace what we lose through with Mings being not being there with winning headers. And you can argue that, you know, I'll get to that in a minute more actually with the Liverpool game coming up, uh, that the physicality isn't quite there, is it? You know, with Mings gone, Diego Carlos and Consa probably have it. I would say that Pau Torres and Longley are a bit more, um, you know, uh, they are physical, they're quick, you know, they've played a very, very physical football before, but they're not really as physical as Mings, are they? And they're not as dominant in the air, I would think, as Mings and um, potentially Carlos. Uh, but I, I, I think, I think he would be, I think he'd be a solid backup, you know, I think a solid, you know, good squad depth again. Um, and I can understand some, you know, apprehension about it, but I, I think Emery knows a player. I think he knows what he's looking for. I know he's looking for a very, I think he's looking for a very specific type of defender as well. Um, because if Torres is out, there's no one to come in and offer what he offers, really, because neither Carlos or Conte are as good on the ball um, or anywhere close to it, really, as Pal Torres is. And Long Lane might be closer to that. So Long Lane might be a, you know, a good standing, essentially, particularly in Europe. So I'm, I'm, I'm not against it. I, you know, I want to know what the fees are. I'm very conscious of FFP and I'm sure Monchi and um, Emery are as well. And that's why I think there's been a bit of a, a clear out, really, um, you know, since Ings left all the way back in January of players who are high earners. I think that's probably why Dean was linked with leaving. Uh, though, you know, the injury to Moreno and the potential hiccups we're trying to get in Marcos Acuna from Sevilla uh means i think and you know dean's form as well recently has been really really good um but i think that was probably i i theorize that might have been why they were quite keen to move him on um just because you know during the late gerard perslow era we took on a lot of players who had big wages and you know everton did something similar and look what happened there you know so you know, you do have to be mindful of these things, I think. Um, please do write in the comments if you think I'm talking total rubbish, but that's just, you know, me and me probably been a bit more, uh, you know, um, wary of things, I guess, and, you know, still burnt out from what happened under Randy Lerner when we spent loads of money, um, loads of wages, you know, big wages at the time, 50000 a week for the likes of Steve Sidwell. The hell? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, didn't make the Champions League and the taps got turned off. Martin O'Neill left and look what happened, you know, a long year of decline. I'm not saying that, um, you know, Sawiris and Edens would do that. I think they're in it. They seem like they're in it for a much more of a long haul than learner, but you can, you know, you can never say never, can you? So I think it's better to be, you know, to be cautious. Um, uh, and, you know, I think we have had a, a good transfer window so far. Uh, Diaby's a fantastic signing by the looks of it. Uh, Tielemans, again, really Good squad depth is on big wages, no doubt. But you know, a free, um, you know, no transfer fee there. So, 
you know, I, I think that's a good signing personally. Um, and then Torres as well, lovely player. I think we've really seen what he offers on the ball, particularly, and why. And I'll, you know, I'll speak in a minute about why Emery was so keen to get him in. Uh, I do notice this light here has gone off, so I uh, should have charged that up, shouldn't I? Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, uh, you know, I think a right back would, you know, be nice or a versatile defender, a long layer. I understand it. Um, I do worry about Ollie Watkins still. I worry if there's an injury to him, what what's there for Villa. Yonderan, he's really young. I know he got a goal against Everton, but he's very raw, isn't he? And he does look like a player that could ideally have a loan, but I think he's going he's gonna to stick around this season. I think he, I think he has to, really, because we just don't have the depth. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe he can, you know, quickly adapt to the Premier League. You know, he's got his goal now. So, you know, maybe he'll, you know, start against Hibernian, for instance, and that can only help him, surely, getting experience at a very high level. Um and also, you know, uh, goalkeeper, I still worry about Emmy Martinez, the drop-off from Martinez to Robin Olsen. I get it. Most clubs have uh, quite a bit of a drop-off between their number one and number two goalkeepers. Yeah, that's fair enough, apart from maybe Arsenal now with uh, Ramsdale and David Raya. Um, but I think the reason Arsenal brought in David Raya is because they know there was such a drop-off from uh, Ramsdale to, you know, I think it was probably Matt Turner at the time was there backup goalkeeper, sold in Snotting and Forest. And essentially, if there is such a major drop-off and it really affects how you're able to play out, that's going to cost you a lot of points. And for Arsenal, it could cost them the title or could cost some trophies. And for Villa, I don't know. I don't know. You know, if, if Martinez is out, you know, he's injured right now. I mean, who knows? Could he be out for weeks? Well, you know, hopefully not. Hopefully he's back for Liverpool. But if, you know, let's say, dare I say, he is out for like a month or so at some point. What what's lost in that period, and you know, it it, it is a drop off, and I, you know I I understand it's probably very very difficult to find goalkeepers who are willing to come in and be backups who are of a high quality, but I do wonder if there is a keeper out there who could come in and be a backup who's just more comfortable on the ball than we're currently seeing. I don't want to get at Villa players. I like also I love all Villa players, of course I do. Um, I support them massively, and also had some really good moments against Burnley, but there were those moments on the ball where you kind of thought, oh, I don't know. That, that to me, striker and goalkeeper just seems like the one. Maybe And, and another defender, I think, now probably would help. Um, but a versatile attacker, a striker, versatile attacker, uh, something like that. And, you know, a couple of these big-name players that haven't moved yet, the Jao Felix, you know, he hasn't gone. From uh, Alessio Madrid, that's still rumbling on. So, who knows? Uh, you know, I won't, I won't rule out any kind of... Uh, surprise late move, but you know, Villa are quite noisy in the transfer window now. I think Fabrizio Romano seems to have a direct line into Villa Park and knows what's happening, which is very different to how it was under Johan Lang and uh, Christian Perslow. So, uh, yes. Um, anyway, thought I'd talk about that. Please let me know what you think. What do you want to see at Villa? Write in the comments below, like this as well. Uh, subscribe, I keep saying it. Um, but also, Liverpool next, do you know? I'm quite excited about that. Anfield away, it's not the kind of fixture you normally look forward to too much, is it? Particularly in the Jurgen Klopp era, where you just think, my goodness, we're going to go up there and it's going to be the Alamo, isn't it? Liverpool play at such a, a pace. They're such a fantastic, well coached, you know, heavy metal football team. Um, I, I've always loved Jurgen Klopp teams. And I think that. Liverpool in attack still look like they're really, you know, they're mean business, don't they? And they have so much depth. Mo Salah still looks like he's, you know, in fantastic form. Um, they've got Diogo Jota, Luis Diaz, who looks a really fine player. Darwin Nunez, a player who I think is a bit underrated, actually. I think he had a bit of a struggle last season, but that was just adapting to the first season in the Premier League. And if you look at his stats, he actually did pretty well. Um, you know, they weren't that bad. Probably not the level you want from a player they spent as much as they did on. But uh, I think, you know, in first season, it's not bad. Very young player as well. And I think this season, you know, those two goals against Newcastle were absolutely fantastic. In a high-pressure moment, to put those two chances away like that, drag Liverpool back, 10-man team at Newcastle at St. James's Park, really tough place to go. That's 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 an amazing performance from, uh, you know, a young player and probably indicative of what he might actually go on and do this season, Darwin Nunes. I think he's a player, I think, uh, to look out for, actually. Um, you know, I, did I mention Diogo Jota as well, of course. Cody Gakpo, a really good player. 
So, you know, they're in attack, they're obviously going to cause us problems. They just will. But last season, you know, Liverpool were on a seven-game winning streak. And who ended it? The mighty Aston Villa. How? By playing very intelligent football. And that was first half. We absolutely caught them on the hop, didn't we? Because they kept bringing Trent Alexander-Arnold in from the right back. You know, he played at right back. So when they're out of possession, four at the back. And then as soon as they're in possession, Trent goes up into that midfield role, which loads of teams love to do now. Arsenal love to do it. Bloody City have been doing it. Now, Liverpool, well, Liverpool have been doing it since sort of midway through last season. And it worked wonders for them. They went on big winning streak. They're currently 14 games unbeaten. But seven game win game winning streak came to an end because when Trent went into that um, uh, midfield role, we, Unai Emery, genius that he is, Professor Unai, he had uh, John McGinn playing as the second striker. And John McGinn, every single time Trent would come into that midfield, John McGinn just stuck to him. And that's what's so good about McGinn as attacker is because his defending from the front is really, really good. Uh, and do I think Emery will do the same again? Uh, I think Emery's, you know, he'll watch Liverpool and he'll, mate, mate, he'll have seen things that w- none of us will see. So who's to know? You know, he might he might ch- shift it up again. You know, Diaby's there now as well, which, you know, slightly changes things and might change how Villa approach the game. Um, would Diaby be as good as a second striker in the defensive role as McGinn was? Not sure about that. Um, but, you know... Um, that, but McGinn is in brilliant form at the moment. And against Liverpool at Anfield, you know, back, I think it was in April, uh, he um, was so good at not just defending against Trent, but also when he got the ball deep, Liverpool played that high line. And then he would whip that ball in for Ollie Watkins and Watkins would run down, cause havoc for Liverpool's defence. He won a penalty, which annoyingly he missed. Um, but there were a few occasions where we really caught them because McGinn was playing that ball from, from uh, you know, Coming deep, getting it, and there's catching that high line out with Ollie Watkins runs in behind. And I would not be surprised if we see quite similar. But Villa are a different team now. Um, and Villa play, you know, that signing of Pau Torres, it really makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, because John McKenzie said it on a TFO football recently. The quickest way to attack, you want to go right through the centre, which is such a good way to put it, obviously. It's obvious when you think about it like that, but sometimes, you, you know, you overcomplicate it in your head. But you look at Villa and you look at, you know, what I've really noticed we've been doing this season, and I've said it over and over again, I'm like a broken bloody record, uh, you know, like a Beatles record from the 60s. It just won't, you know, won't play properly anymore. Basically... What I keep seeing happening is that Villa will have the uh, Bubakar Kamara and Douglas Luiz will come deep. They might split apart, and we just will pass it back and forth amongst our def- amongst our defence. Let the opposition come on to us, and with the two midfielders lined deep, you think right, there's an option there where you could pass it to Bubakar Kamara. There's a triangle where Kamara could then pass it to Douglas Luiz, and Douglas Luiz can maybe take a touch, look for somebody else. Or he could do a quick one round the corner into Diaby, who's sitting a bit deeper, or maybe an Ollie Watkins who's come deep. You know, it, it that that's one option. Or what could happen is you've got two players on yeah, uh, Doug, Doug Suiz and Bubakar Kamara, and they split apart, right? And then a gap opens, and the two defensive players follow them, right? Uh, or try and get a bit closer to them. And with that little gap, then you get, Diaby in particular, Diaby or McGinn or Watkins in particular, Diaby, right? And it happened against Burnley, uh, it happened in pre season, particularly with Torres, and it happened, um, you know, a couple of times uh, against Newcastle, even I remember at Everton, where Pau Torres would see that gap open and he whips it straight into Diaby. And we also saw it with D- uh, Diego Carlos, which was amazing to see because he's not someone we've seen be too great on the ball just yet because we haven't seen a lot of him, have we? I've, I know we've seen him hit a ball over the top a few times, which he seems to like to do, but that ball along the floor against Burnley, which led to the second goal. Again, it all came through patient play. Ball through the midfield, through the Burnley press, straight back to front really rapidly. Villa can play the ball back to front really rapidly, into the feet of Watkins, round the corner um, to... I think it was Matty Cash and then Cash coming inside. Diaby takes it. Diaby then pulls it back. 
uh, and then Cash hits it into the goal. The movement, the back to front, the speed of it all, the patience. Aston Villa, my goodness, it's like the Mona Lisa. I want to cry thinking about it. It's that beautiful. So against Liverpool, will they do? Will we do that? Uh, you know, it's it's hard not to go to Liverpool and just you know be tempted to sit back, is it? But what Villa did do was Villa stuck to the high line at Anfield last time we went there in the one-one draw, and Villa played it absolutely brilliantly for the entirety of the game. To be honest all 107 bloody minutes of it, it felt like, um, where so often that Villa's high line would come so far forward, Liverpool obviously played their high line, that it was such it was so condensed, really, on the, on the pitch, that every time Liverpool would try and make a run, they were constantly getting caught offside. They just couldn't time those runs properly, or they'd overheat the pass, and it would just roll straight into the hands of Emi Martinez. Now, they're such a great team, Jurgen Klopp's obviously going to, you know, worked on that. He's going to look at it and work out how can they make sure that doesn't happen again. And to be honest, you know, on that right hand side, Salah running in behind a, a Luca Dean, who I don't imagine will get forward as much at Anfield, but will probably have to time it intelligently when he does go forward. But you know, Salah running at him or running at uh, uh, Torres, or maybe. You know, Darwin Nunes using his physicality against Torres, maybe sticking quite tight to him, making him comfortable and not really also allowing him to make the pass that Villa like to do from back to front too quickly. Maybe that could be something we see at Anfield. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I know exactly how they're going to start. But one thing I have noticed with Liverpool, you know, their defence has been somewhat chaotic. It hasn't been great for about a year now, to be honest. But this season, again, it's been a bit... As good as they've been in attack and as great as they you know, were in the first sort of half an hour at Chelsea, which they drew 1-1, and then Chelsea ended up being on top of them for most of the game, as good as they were to fight back against Newcastle, for a lot, long periods of both games, they looked chaotic in defence. And against Bournemouth at home, they looked chaotic in defence. And Bournemouth were unlucky not to score two or three goals you know, in the first half alone. So Villa can cause that kind of havoc in their defence, which, you know, the way we've been playing against Everton, Hibbs, and... Um, uh, Burnley, particularly Burnley, and all you know, Newcastle as well. We had created a lot of chance, you know, or did some good stuff up top in that game as well. If we can do that in the first half in particular, you know, and take our chances, who knows what can happen? Um, but you know, you just got to caveat that with the obvious, you know, truth that they are just going to create chances and they are going to put us under a lot of pressure, and that cop end is going to be, you know, loud and proud and all as it is. So uh, it's just dealing with that and, you know, not having Tyrone Mings there to marshal that high line. This is quite a test, actually, isn't it? Because we haven't really, we won't have played as good an attack as this pretty much all season, really. And without Mings there to marshal that high line, it's going to be interesting to see whether Torres, a cancer or a, a Carlos can step up and, uh, and, and do that. But this is an opportunity for them to do it. And, you know, Carlos is a leader, you know, in particular, he, he was a um, severe, you know, and he's shown it on occasions. In the few occasions, he had a chance to play for the Villa. So you know, Torres is a is a high level player. Hunts is you know an experienced player. So they, you know they've got to get it together. Um, you know, and I also remember at Anfield, Leon Bailey was really poor in that game when he played further forward. That's who he is. He's inconsistent. Some days he's unplayable, like he was against Man United last season at, at Villa Park. Other days, he's just not very good at all, as he was at Anfield last season. So I'm going to guess that Matty Cash, after his superb performance uh, at Burnley, is probably going to start uh, at Anfield. That's that's my guess. Um, and I, I can't wait to see what he does. Um, you know, I'm really excited now to see what Cash does in a more advanced role, if that's going to be his, his position this season, or whether, you know, maybe Emery mixes it up and maybe puts... You know, uh, McGinn in the sort of second strike role puts Diaby on the right at some point, but I would I would guess that Diaby's going to be uh, a second strike and McGinn will be out on the left. That would be my guess as to what happens. Um, but who can read the mind of Professor Unai? Who can read it? Uh, I sure can't. Um, so yeah, uh, I think it'll, it'll yes, it'll be interesting to see how Villa can cope with that highlight. It's a big test for that defense. 
Um, but every single time I see Villa play now, I just feel really good about us. Isn't it great to watch Villa play now? It's bloody exciting. It's as exciting as, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it's exciting. Somebody tell me. What do you what do you think is exciting as us? Go on, write in the comments. You tell me. Um, but anyway, look, uh, I've rabbited on long enough. Uh, I think Villa's going to score at Liverpool. And I think we're going to get more than one goal. Virgil van Dijk's not playing. So, you know, they're equivalent of the Tyrone Mings marshalling at the back. He ain't there. So, again, you know, defence has been somewhat chaotic, particularly against Bournemouth at Anfield two games ago. I don't see why Villa can't cause that defence problems. And I think we will. Um, just, you know, how do we cope with their incredible attackers? And, you know, their CDM, you know, they had uh, Endo there uh, playing there against Newcastle, the new signing, the Japanese player signing from Germany. Um, <laughs> it's the last 58 minutes at Newcastle. Didn't have a great game. Jurgen Klopp said he doesn't have a clue uh, how we play here, uh, which I think means, you know, he's not a bad player. He just doesn't know how Liverpool play. He's got to adapt to that. Um, so it's quite a comment to make about one of your own players, though. But, um, but yeah, will Endo play in that CDM role? Or maybe Alexis McAllister steps back there. I definitely don't think that's the best role for Alexis McAllister. Super player, much better in the sort of advanced Douglas Louise kind of uh, John McGinn style role, Alexis McAllister. That's where you see the best of him. And that's where he'll get involved with goals and assists. As a CDM, he's all right. He's, he's very good at it, but it's a bit like McGinn. It's, like, it's not where you want them. It's not the best role. And you can see why Liverpool have spent or tried to spend 110 million quid on Caicedo, who's gone to Chelsea, and Lavia, who went from uh, Southampton to Chelsea as well for about 60 million quid too. So uh, you could say so Liverpool, they're flawed. You know, that CDM role, you know, who knows? Maybe they'll sign someone before the transfer window's out. Um, maybe Endo steps up and actually has a really good performance on his first day at Anfield. Um, or McAllister steps in and does really well. But I would say that there are some, there are significant players missing there, particularly Van Dijk, and there's no reason for they can't get at them. I hope Emmy Martinez is back. I hope we can, you know, adapt to not having Mings there to play that high line in a high pressure environment. It did, you know, Newcastle, we struggled, but Liverpool, hopefully, um, we can maintain our discipline. That's, you know, a bit of a worry there, but I think, you know, would you bet against Aston Miller? Because I tell you what, I bloody well wouldn't please like and subscribe comment below with your thoughts give me your score prediction and up the mighty villa